and we should be good to go. Okay, so welcome everybody to Intro to Trapping. Uh, tonight, Curtis is going to be really carrying this for us. He has done, uh, what was it, Trapper Ed in Wisconsin, Curtis? Yep, yep. I was the Trapper Education Coordinator for the DNR in Wisconsin for almost three years, so pretty pretty good amount of time. Yeah, we're happy to finally, as a program, really to start um, providing some Trapper education um, with something that this program definitely was lacking. We were happy to, to kind of pick up once you came on board um, for the past almost two years now, I think. But uh, so we're happy to get this going. So um, tonight, what are we going to be talking about? For sure. Yeah. Well, trapping is something that I think really has a lot of appeal to new outdoors people because of uh, opportunity and access, you know, which is something we all know is tough to come by, especially with species like deer. Um, it, it can be really tough. And a lot of people are finding, especially once they get to exploring the outdoors, that um, they may not have the access to deer that they thought they did, at least not starting out. So interspecies like squirrels, rabbits, but also raccoons, muskrats. And if you uh, include trapping into that, you uh, get some access to some critters that are at potentially historic high levels in terms of coyotes and raccoons um, and ones that are close to town um, and even ones that can be pursued at night. So a lot of things to do um, a lot of benefits to going after fur bears. And tonight we're going to be talking just about trapping. So trapping is extremely um, uh, diverse. There's so much that goes into it. This is strictly an intro to trapping in Illinois webinar. So we're not going to dive into any one aspect really uh, super deep, but we're going to try to give the broad like 40,000 foot view of what trapping in Illinois is. And then of course, any questions that may come up, there's the chat and the Q&A feature. Feel free to use those and, and we'll try to address those as they come up. So pretty cool with that. I'll go, mm -hmm. go ahead and get into advancing the slides. Had to click on it. There we go. Uh, quick reminders, all the webcams, microphones are disabled. Um, already talked about using the chat window and Q&A. Uh, one little note about the chat window, you can select who it goes to. So you can either send it just to uh, the host, Jason and I, or to everybody, or just to an individual person. Um, after the webinar, we will send out a recording. So if you miss something, uh, don't fret. You'll have the recording. You can watch it at your leisure at any time. Um, there'll also be a feedback survey. Please fill those out. We use those to help kind of guide what we do and how we uh, provide programs and stuff for you all. So good stuff. And uh, like Jason said, my name's Curtis. Thanks for being here. And then also we got Jason who is muted, but he says hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we already got a question that's already answered. This chat is, uh, has been disabled for attendees. I'll see if I can change that for you all. Oh, um, okay. And I'll work on that, don't worry. But you can put in the questions and we'll be able to see the questions for right now. Already technical difficulties. We well, see we're, we're a lot better in the field than we are on computers, but um, we'll, we'll do our best to present this here to you all. What are we going to go over? Well, it's going to be a lot, so we're going to move pretty quick. But uh, like I mentioned, trapping is diverse, which uh, gives a lot of stuff to talk about. It's, it's also one of the reasons that makes it fun. You know, there are people, there are trappers that do completely different things and their hobbies don't overlap. You know, I know people that are big time um, upland predator trappers, you know, primarily coyotes, maybe a little bit of bobcat and fox. And uh, they may trap their whole life and never encounter the water trapper who's after primarily beaver, muskrat, otter, maybe raccoon. Uh, they're both trappers, but they, uh, they're completely separate wings. So the diversity is pretty cool. We're going to get right into it here. Um, let's talk about the large scale rise of agriculture. This has impacted Illinois in a huge way. Drive down the road, you can see it. We've got huge fields of corn, uh, for better or worse, that's there. And that's impacted creatures across our landscape in different ways. You know, some critters, not so good, especially the, the large carnivores who used to live here, um, talking wolves, mountain lions, the whole nine yards uh, back in the extra, uh, extirpation era, which is before regulated hunting and trapping, those critters are largely wiped out 
And uh, that opened up a, a big niche for critters like the coyote who had been suppressed for a long time. And now all of a sudden they had no, no larger predator other than man. So um, coyotes and raccoons have largely benefited from agriculture and the, uh, the reduction of larger predators bigger than them. Um, and that provides a lot of opportunity for hunters and trappers of today. Now, hunters and trappers are conservationists. This is one thing that uh, a lot of people don't think about, but whether it, this be by the purchase of your hunting and trapping licenses, permits, habitat stamps, all that money goes back into conservation to benefit all species, but then also by the uh, Pittman-Robertson Act, the sale of firearms and sporting uh, goods has a, an excise tax built right into it, 10 to 11% that outdoors people pay. And this money uh, comes back to the states and supports conservation, again, for all species, not just game species. But this has led us to some uh, really awesome conservation success stories. And I, I mentioned before how in the eradication area, there were some not so good things. We know about the passenger pigeon that's gone, the the bison that was almost wiped out, you know, those were failures or near, near failures, but it's important to note that the difference is since the advent of regulated hunting and trapping, these activities have never led to a species becoming endangered or extinct. Um, and to a lot of outdoors people, they're thinking, well, you know, duh, that's common knowledge. But uh, to folks who are not involved with the outdoors, that's kind of a um a new re revelation because they kind of lump it all together whether it be passenger pigeons or the hunting and trapping of today so really important to make that distinction now what is a fur bear that's the first thing to ask because all mammals have fur right even us people we just have a lot less than most of them but a uh, fur bear is actually it's a designation by uh, management agencies so just like how deer or big game and pheasants are upland game. There are certain critters that are fur bears. And these are uh, the animals that have historically been harvested primarily for their fur. Now that doesn't mean that's the only reason that they're harvested, but that was the primary uh, motivating factor. So that's the difference between a muskrat and a rabbit per se. A uh, really diverse group. I mean, we're talking the largest rodent in North America when it comes to the, the beaver, second largest rodent in the world. Um, and the smallest vertebrate carnivore in the whole world, the, the least weasel, which uh, we don't have a ton of out there. There's a few of them out there, but uh, really cool, smallest uh, vertebrate carnivore in the whole world. They tackle animals the size of a cottontail rabbit, which would be kind of the equivalent of us trying to tackle a, a bison and kill it with our teeth. So that's, that's pretty cool. Got to respect that. Um, and management varies. So this is another thing where to the lay person, you might look at fur bears and think, oh, well, there is no management because there's no daily bag limit in most uh, cases. And that's that would be incorrect. Just the management looks a little bit different. And to talk about this a little bit, some of you might remember back to your um, high school biology or or uh, ecology days and, and remember this. But species are either like an R strategist or a K strategist, right? And uh, most species are going to fall somewhere in between on this spectrum. But if we think of humans as like the prototypical K strategist, we have very few offspring over our lifespan, but we live a long time. Um, on the vice versa of that is something like mice or muskrats, which are in the mouse family, Chrysididae. Uh, they have a ton of offspring. They don't live very long. So different strategy. And uh, that affects how they're managed from the, the management level. So because the fur bear group is very diverse, this management is very diverse. And some species like muskrats, raccoons, coyotes, they're managed only with season length. And in coyotes, they do have a trapping season. The hunting season never, never closes. So that's a, a very open and liberal um, uh, strategy on coyotes all the way down to species with lower reproductive uh, potential like badger and river otter, uh, that they are susceptible to over harvest if left unchecked. Um, they do have a, a season limit. So in badger, it's one in the south, two in the north, and in river otter, it's five statewide. So a little different management strategy 
Then there's Bobcats, which is kind of the um, most restrictive in Illinois. And there is actually a, a drawing lottery where you have to be awarded the Bobcat permit before you can uh, pursue them. So very, the strategy varies along with the species. And I mentioned it before, but uh, especially in terms of coyotes and raccoons, they may be the highest population levels in Illinois uh, today that's that's ever, you know, since European settlement or even before, uh, because of some of these reasons we talked about. And so that uh, requires management goals, especially when you're dealing with species that do sometimes become a nuisance. And that could be a farmer with um, with livestock or even just your backyard chicken operation, whatever that might be. People do have issues with these, even if you don't have livestock or anything, uh, raccoons especially are one of the um, top two or three nuisance animals that in cities will uh, take up residence in people's chimneys or attic or somewhere else like that. So a lot of interactions with these species. Uh, management seeks to just reduce and give it, give away to to handle and mitigate those um, those conflicts when they arise also gives us a way to manage uh, disease outbreaks. A lot of these critters do have, uh, we're lucky that we don't have the rabies issue that they have on the East Coast uh, with like raccoon rabies or anything like that. But we do have canine distemper that runs rampant some years. Uh, we do have an, uh, like sarcoptic mange really bad in coyotes and foxes some years, really hard on foxes. Some of these diseases, um, are pretty bad right now and a lot of that is tied to the population density the more dense the population is the quicker that these uh these things can spread through the population and turn a little problem into a big problem so manage that but another thing we don't want to forget about is just monitoring the health of of species that have really low detection rates and that might be a new term to some folks but when you look at animals they all have different detection rates deer super high if you live in the country and you have deer around you, you're going to see them. Maybe not every day, but you're going to see them pretty often. Uh, now, you might also have coyotes, bobcats, foxes right around you too, but you see them way less often. The detection rates are way lower. They're way less active in daylight hours, and they're just more um, uh, better at staying away from people and out of our view. So it's really helpful to have that uh, trapping season each year where the DNR has access to carcass, to tissue collection uh, when it's needed. And it almost acts as a century if there is a disease or something that's impacting these populations, it wouldn't pop up if, if hunt, hunters and trappers weren't out there looking for them because normal folks don't see them. Now tracks, this is one of the fun parts about trapping. It's really, it's an intimate, you're learning to think like an animal, even more so than when you hunt. I mean, when you're hunt, you're doing that to a certain extent, but in trapping, you're trying to get an animal to step on something the size of a half dollar in that whole vast wilderness. So you need to know everything you can about it, what it, where it's going and the landscape that it travels on. A big part of that is tracking. First off, finding where you're going to set, uh, where you're going to locate your sets at, and all these animals, so diverse. I think we got, I can't remember if it's 14, 15, 16 fur bears that are uh, classified as fur bears here in Illinois, and then several other animals that are leaving tracks out there in the, the woods too. So where do you start? First off, my first thing, count the toes. Always count the toes and try to find multiple tracks. One track can always be misleading, but if you can find three or four, get yourself a nice average. Um, counting the toes is gonna tell you, is it a cat or dog or is it something else, basically? Because uh, cats or dogs, meaning bobcats, coyotes, foxes, all the way to house cats and your pet dog, they're gonna show four toes in their track. Uh, the fifth toe is the dew claw, which is way up, way up, um, you know, like a vestigial digit on dogs and cats. So it doesn't show in the track. Um, most common dogs, they remove them, um, you know, when they're puppies, uh, at least on sporting dogs, so they don't catch on anything and rip off. But you always see four toes. 
on pretty much every other animal out there that isn't something like a deer, which obviously is a hooved animal, a cervid, uh, you're going to see five toes. So that's a quick thing right off the bat. Now, if it does have four toes, how do you determine if it's a cat or dog? A lot of good ways. This uh, picture here sh shows us some pretty good ways. Uh, first thing, claw marks. Obviously, dogs do not have retractable claws. The claws should always be visible, not in every track, but if you see enough tracks, you should see it. Uh, now with bobcats and house cats and mountain lions, retractable claws. So most of their tracks are not going to show claws. Now they can pull them out when they're running up a slippery bank or if they're in mud. Uh, they may push them out to get some more traction, so it may be possible to find a track with them out, but I've, I've actually never seen a, a cat track with the claws showing, so it is pretty rare. But that's not the only thing you can look for. Also, look at the shape of the pad. This is a big one. Uh, when it comes to cats, they've got two points on the front, the leading edge, and three on the back. And when it comes to canines, it's one point on the front, two on the back. Um, big designation you can also between if you just narrow it down to just your dog track so now i know it's a dog track because um it's got one point on the front of the pad two on the back i see the claws now is it a dog or a coyote a lot of that you can determine by sort of the width and the shape of the track coyotes are always going to be egg shaped uh, unless they're running at a full trot where they're sp splayed out a little bit more their tracks are always going to be really, really egg shaped. It's very evident in that uh, picture down there in the in the lower part, um, but very tight, very together. Whereas a dog, that they're going to have a lot wider. It's only going to be one lobe on the front of the leading edge of that pad, but it's going to be a lot wider, a lot more room for the toes to to splay out. And even when they're walking, uh, their tracks are going to be more oval and less of that sort of classic egg shape. Another good thing to look at, just the, the toes if they're irregular. Cats, and again, this is from house cat up to mountain lion, they have irregular, they have a leading toe. So if you look at those, the toes on the front, they don't quite match up exactly like they do with a dog. So on a dog track, that always gives a really good impression of an X in the middle of a track, even if it's old and you can't make out the claws. You see that X, you know it's a dog. Uh, the cats don't leave a good X because those front two toes, they don't line up, have a leading toe. So pretty cool. More than one way to skin a cat and more than one way to tell a, a cat track. But uh, oh, and then I should mention, so now cats, you've determined it's a cat track. Is it a house cat? Is it a bobcat or is it a mountain lion? Your pinky right here, your little pinky, at least on me, it works. Each section is an inch, and that just so happens to be perfect. If you lay your pinky across the pad of the cat track and it's one section, well, that's probably a house cat. If it's two sections, that's probably a bobcat. And if it's three sections, that's probably a mountain lion. Uh, if it's even bigger than that, then it's probably a lynx because they have huge, giant snowshoe feet. But um, should definitely not be any lynx passing through here. Anything's possible, but that's one that's uh, downright almost impossible. So some other really common tracks you're going to find out there that are very unique, easy to ID, raccoon and possum. 90% of the time when I worked for the Wisconsin DNR, if somebody sent me a picture, it was usually one of these two, uh, just because there's a lot of these critters running around there and they do have tracks that look kind of weird sometimes. So uh, with possums, they got that, that opposable thumb, that halix on their rear foot that's super diagnostic, only animal moving around out there of that size that you're gonna see with a track like that. And then their front hand kind of looks like a perfect little handprint, which is, is pretty cool uh, for the possums. But raccoons, just a little more elongated. And again, their front and back feet are different. So you get a different track with each one. And so sometimes some people will see the larger back footprint and well, oh geez what's this it doesn't look like the the smaller raccoon prints all over the place that's just their back foot which doesn't always uh completely contact the ground but then when it does they can leave a pretty big track uh raccoons of course one of the only animals out there that are plantigrade like us 
um, and bears, you know, that walk flat footed. Most of these critters are what they call digigrade. They walk up on their toes, leave a little different mark, but five toes, of course, on, on all those. Now tracks aren't the only thing you find. There's also some scat out there. Um, this can sometimes be a great way to not only determine where animals are at, but also uh, can be a way to find the periphery of their ranges. So in terms of coyotes, which have scat full of hair, pretty easy to, to uh, looks a lot like your dog poop, but just full of hair and bone fragments and things of that nature. Uh, bobcat poop will look pretty sim similar, but it's more uh, cylindrical and blunt and in these kind of little segments. But um, but anyway, where, wherever you find concentrations of coyote poop is generally the edge of their home range, which is an excellent place to, to try to set sets because they're going to spend a higher percentage of their time sort of patrolling the periphery looking for outsiders. Another good thing about the periphery is normally that's where multiple home ranges will come together. So instead of just uh, trying for one basically coyote or one small pack of coyotes home range, you might be in the home range of three or four different um, family groups or, or animals. So great place to set. Raccoons, uh, they love to use the same place that's in the open over and over and over again. Sometimes you'll find places just with, you know, what looks like weeks and weeks of, of uh, raccoon scats. These can sometimes be good places to for set locations near there. And then otter, another thing you can look for sign, especially islands or uh, where a creek will hit a river good places to look for otter scat, which will just be a, a big conglomeration of fish scales and exoskeletons and all that kind of stuff. Smells horrible, but good place to look for them. And then also, luckily, some critters make, uh, make some pretty cool things that we can find, uh, most famous of which beaver. They're awesome engineers. They make their own habitat types, and they're awesome, great wonderful critters and I think that's important to uh, realize that like trappers for the most part have a ton of respect for beaver they never want to trap every beaver out of an area because they they're awesome they give us areas to duck hunt all that kind of stuff but at the same time we got to understand that beaver can be incredibly destructive and that could be by flooding that could be by taking down trees and it's not their fault they're just beavers being a beaver but Luckily, they do have a bunch of uses, and so uh, we can hopefully manage them with a with a trapping season. And um, beaver are one critter that not only has a good hide, they've also got glands that have a lot of uses. They're also tasty, really good to eat. So a lot of benefits with them. But um, yeah, they make these structures. We all know about dams, you know, damming up any moving water to create deeper water habitat um, on the up river side of that. And uh, they'll also make lodges, underwater entrances, all kinds of cool things. You can read some of the old like frontiersman uh, literature where people will talk about hiding, you know, whether they're hiding during war times from uh, enemy soldiers or people hiding from raiding uh, Native American groups or whatever. And, and they, they hide in beaver lodges. So that's pretty cool. Um, and cuttings. This is one duck hunters always got to be aware of, you know, walking around. Uh, unfortunately, beavers leave little sharp stobs all over and these can ruin your waders. They can ruin your day. They can ruin your weekend if you fall on one for sure. So um, definitely watch out for those. And then the muskrat huts, they push them up in the fall and spring. And it's, you know, these little guys, they, they're, they eat almost entirely vegetation and they're susceptible to predators, lots, lots of predators. Uh, birds of prey love muskrats. They're delicious little furball McNuggets basically swimming around in the pond and everything wants to pick them off. So in the fall, they make all these little push-ups so that even when it ices and they, they're little muskrats that can't break through the ice, they can get up in these huts and access dry land, but be covered from the top so an eagle or a hawk or something doesn't pluck them and, and make a meal of them. So pretty cool. So yeah, legal game. Get right into it. Here's the, the fur bears we got. All those animals are fur bears except for woodchuck. 
a woodchuck is actually designated, I think, as a game species. So a little bit different, but it is listed in the trapping season. And it, it does have a little bit different season because, um, uh, remember, woodchucks do hibernate. So they're not, we don't see them in the late fall, winter, not until the spring when they do pop out. So a little bit different issue there. And then I did already mention that bobcats are one special species that you can't um, uh, try to pursue them until uh, you actually do draw a tag. So now one question that we hear, what happens if you incidentally catch one? Like you set a set for a coyote, incidentally catch a bobcat, that's, you haven't done anything wrong. Nothing is illegal there. Uh, you just need to try to release that animal as quickly as possible. I can tell you from working in Wisconsin, bobcats hold up extremely well, uh, extremely well to foothold. So much so, most of the time, you can't even tell which foot was in the trap. And when I was in Wisconsin, they had had over 100 bobcats that had all been trapped by private trappers and then called in because they didn't have a tag. The DNR runs out there, uh, sedates them, puts a collar on them, takes measurements, releases them. Over a hundred cats, not a single capture related mortality, which is absolutely astounding. Um, yeah, for that, it, to, just to give you a frame of reference, if we set up a mist net to catch birds, songbirds, and we caught a hundred, we would almost assuredly have a couple mortalities in there. So uh, yeah, bobcats hold up really well to footholds. Releasing them, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's also not incredibly hard either. Um, I have I wouldn't recommend to do it with a dip net, but I have done it with just a fishing net uh, one time when, when it needed to be done. So uh, definitely a whole, ca carrying around a tub like a big plastic tub that you might get at Farm and Fleet or a store like that is an excellent way. Carry it in the back of your truck. You can throw gear in there. And when you do catch a critter that you need to release or that you want to release, just throw that tub over them, you know, pull their paw out, release them, flip over the tub, and it's they don't have access to either bite or scratch you while you're releasing them. So... Now, we're just going to go over the highlights because, again, trapping is broad. Uh, we don't have time to get into depth. We Basically, every single slide in this whole presentation, we could do a full, you know, hour, 90 minutes on to do it justice. So we're, we're moving through pretty quick. But um, some of the highlights here to talk about um, it, when it comes to trapping in Illinois, and this this is very state specific. So... Uh, this information applies to Illinois only. If you trap in another state, uh, most of this stuff, if not all of it's going to be different. So just definitely be aware of that. One thing that's always the same, you've always got to tag your traps. Always a metal tag. I've used funky trap tags myself. They're one of the big uh, tag companies. They're inexpensive. Usually get them in a pack of 100 or 500 and you get them printed with either your name and address or your customer ID number. Uh, personally, I recommend the customer ID number. It's simple. It's just one number and it works. You're legal uh, and it never changes. The bad thing about name and address, if you ever move, um, you got to get new tags printed. Whereas theoretically, your customer ID number stays the same always. So I'd go with that. You can also put more than one tag on a trap. If you trap with a trapping partner uh, or even three, whatever, you can put everybody's tag on there and then uh, all of you can can check those traps. So that's the way to do it if you uh, do trap with somebody. Um, there's a lot of trap size and placement restrictions. Uh, basically, I'm not going to go over all the details because it's all in measurements. It's all inside jaw spread, but the basics to remember is you can't use really large traps. You can use a little bit larger traps in water than you can in the land. Not using any teeth, no deadfalls. It's not Looney Tunes. You know, we're not, not doing any of that stuff anymore. Um, snares in Illinois can be used in the water only. So no dry land snares or cable restraints in Illinois. Um, have to be at least a half underwater. 
Uh, all traps have to be run every day and any captured animal removed. Uh, and so that that is throughout the trapping season. Doesn't matter if it's a wet set, dry set, killer trap, or live restraining trap. Every day that they're out there, you have to run them. And that, this is one of the big things that separates trapping from hunting. Hunting, you can choose to go or not go. It's a game time decision. Once you have steel in the ground, you have to get out there every day. There's no taking days off. I don't care if it just snowed 10 inches, you find a way. Um, if you're sick, you find a way. And that's why trapping with a partner is a good way to go. Because if somebody does get sick or injured, you've got somebody to, to fill in the gaps there. Um, don't set a trap within 10 foot from a den on land. So this does not apply to water trapping for muskrats, beaver, anything you're trapping in the water, but you can't trap on dens and dry land. Um, you can't trap within a hundred yards of a dwelling uh, without permission from the landowner. Even if you're on public land or on somebody else's land, if you're within a hundred yards, uh, you really need to talk to that person. And that's for obvious reasons. You don't want to have traps out potentially body grip traps and them to let you know dog out or whatever near their house and not be prepared for that so definitely talk to them if you're if you're close to a house uh, don't disturb anything that the animals create houses dams lodges feed beds you know don't destroy those uh, in certain cases landowners can get permission to to handle those when they become an issue but that's not for the trapper to do. Um, so don't, don't disturb those when you're out there. And yeah, trapping is obviously, it's one of the most regulated activities out there. Um, there's not a ton of people that do it. It's very diverse. So that means a lot of uh, regs and a lot of, um, a lot of diverse regs. So if you have any questions, feel free to shout out at any time contact your conservation police officer contact us at illinois learn to hunt you know we're here to be a resource you're not in it alone uh the regs and all this stuff can be complicated trapping especially so don't get bogged down by it you know we'll get through it together as they say right so where do you find the statewide regs well the the trapping and the hunting regulations all live together so this is really an abridged version this isn't the like the total um, every trapping and hunting law that there is out there that's in the wildlife code, but this is like the cliff notes version good to carry that I it doesn't matter. How many times I read over the regs, even in Wisconsin, where I helped you know publish the regulations booklet I still always carried it with me in the field because there are always times you need to look back at something so definitely good idea to either download that to your phone carry the hard copy. We have to mention um, the huntillinois.org. This is a great place to plan your hunting trapping events. You can look uh, specific regions, specific sites, and then find uh, the basic site specific regulations to find out if you can trap there, if you can hunt fur bears, what you can do. Great place to find that stuff out. And one regulation a lot of times trappers forget about because this uh, trapping season does go over the firearms deer season, you got to wear orange. So definitely if you're uh, trapping, it can be easy to forget when deer season comes up. If you're not taking part, uh, you almost got to like set a reminder on your phone to tell yourself, hey, throw the orange hat and vest or coat in the in the vehicle so you're ready to go. So now, what do you need to be legal for trapping? Well, in Illinois, we're, we're fortunate. The resident trapping license is probably one of the cheapest ones you'll ever find at just 10 bucks. Uh, really good deal there. You got to get the state habitat stamp. Again, just five bucks. So relatively inexpensive to uh, get in there. But again, those, uh, those funds go back to support conservation. So an important part of it. Now, if you're a new trapper born after 1998, trapper education is required before you can uh, get a trapping license. But even if the trapper ed's not required, it's definitely recommended. You can do it online or the uh, Illinois Trappers Association does hold some in-person classes. Um, definitely take that, even if it's not required, it's gonna help you out. And a lot of trapping is hands-on stuff. We're going to have some hands-on trapping stuff. 
uh, coming and be doing more and more of that, hopefully if there's interest, but it's really hard for me to like explain how to like set traps and do that part of it on, on over a, uh, like this through web webcam so in person is definitely the way to do that trapper ed is a good way to get those handling skills and then you can also watch for our in-person classes too um, keep in mind the bobcat lottery got in uh, get into that before the season obviously that's five bucks to get into that and then both bobcat and fisher are what they call sighty species so you do have to pay a $5 registration fee that gets your CITES tag once you're successful. So you don't have to do that part if you don't get one, but if you do get one, uh, you will have to do that another five bucks. And here's what CITES is. So CITES is the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species, but it's uh, it also applies to what they call lookalike species. So both bobcats and river otter are appendix two species, so they're lookalikes. So neither of those species is endangered, but they both look like endangered species because guess what? Pretty much every spotted cat in the world other than bobcats and lynx are endangered. Um, and same with otters. River otters, I think, are the only species out of the five or six species of otter we have in the world that aren't endangered. So um, basically what these CITES tags are, they're plastic tags that'll get affixed to the pelt after you harvest them. Uh, they allow for international sale or moving that critter around. And basically anybody can look at it and know that it was legally harvested and it is a bobcat or it is a river otter from Illinois and not one of these other um, endangered spotted cats or um, otter from South America or whatever it might be. So that's what the CITES tags are all about. Now, once you get a critter mounted or if you get it tanned and you want to hang it up and you never want that, you, you never want to have the possibility of selling that or getting rid of it, you can take the CITES tag off. That's fine, but definitely has to be on it at all times before that. So I mentioned trapper education, uh, really good to get into this. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. Learning from the people who actually do it is, uh, there's no excuse for that. No, nothing will uh, replicate that, especially local people who can also give you information about areas to go, things like that. Really great. I work with trapper education in Wisconsin. So I know more about it in Wisconsin than Illinois so far. I'm still just getting getting into it here in Illinois. But um, yeah, ITA, the Illinois Trappers Association, you can do the trapper education online. Doesn't take that long. It'll give you a nice uh, uh, basis of fundamental and knowledge there. Now, types of traps. First off, want to talk about what I think is like the first big distinction in a trap. Is it a live restraining trap or is it a kill trap? Because we really, all the traps we use are going to fall into one of those two categories and they have very different purposes. Obviously, a kill trap, you want that trap to, uh, when it captures an animal, you want it to kill, dispatch that animal as quickly and humanely as possible. On the vice versa, we've got these live restraining traps, which the purpose of them is to capture an animal and hold it until you, the trapper, are able to get there and decide whether to release or harvest that animal. And um, a lot of people will call box traps live traps. They are a live trap, but they're certainly not the only ones and not even the, the best or the most humane options in all uh, circumstances. So um, all kinds of them here. If we go uh, through the picture, the one in the top uh, left portion of the picture, single long spring, that looks like a number one single long spring there. So a trap a lot of people would use for muskrats, uh, maybe for mink, a little bit small for raccoons, but it could definitely be used in a, a submersion set or what they would call a drowner set. Then next to that, we've got a coil spring. And so now instead of that elongated spring being the powerhouse of the trap, we have a coiled wire that sits below uh, the levers on either side of that. So that's the power mechanism, has a little bit of a smaller footprint when you set it, which can be a good or a bad thing. Uh, sometimes in muddy soil, it's nice to have the long spring to stabilize that trap so it sits there nice and steady. 
And then other times, especially when you're chipping out frozen ground, you're really going to be happy that you've got a coil spring and you can dig a smaller hole in the frozen tundra there. But then we move down to the lower traps. We've got what's called a foot encapsulating trap, or you can call it an enclosed trigger trap. For short, most people are going to call these dog proof traps. Um, DPs, Duke DP looks like what we have a picture of there. These traps are basically raccoon specific. They're not 100% raccoon specific. Uh, definitely occasionally you can get things like a possum, a skunk, um, even a squirrel or something like that in those, but they are like 95% or better uh, raccoon specific. So an awesome trap, especially if you are uh, if you happen to be trapping for a landowner who um, has pets right around their house, but they also have raccoons that they want you to trap, this could be an excellent option to use in those circumstances. And then, of course, the cages, the boxes. Uh, again, I mentioned these are not always, it's incorrect to assume that this is always the most humane trap to use. Uh, they do have issues. We'll talk about the BMP process that uh, AFWA, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, has led the charge on here for the past couple decades here in a, a couple slides. But um, yeah, b box traps are good traps. I'm not trying to say that they're bad, but there's a lot of traps that perform better, especially for species like raccoons, which do have issues, tend to have issues in cages where they try to reach through. And if they have enough room to reach through, they'll just keep pushing their arm further and further through that box and they can kind of damage their arm that way, scrape off their hair. Uh, species like foxes, will get in the corner and try to push and try to bite and they could uh, chip or break their teeth so there are issues there um, and when it comes to bobcats man, you just can't beat a foothold so definitely it's not always as, as clear cut as what you might think before you start getting into trapping now on the other side we've got the killer traps and so these anybody that's ever set a mouse trap well you've set a killer trap it's a body grip trap uh, all these other traps are the same style. They're just built for a little bit bigger mice. This one in the picture doesn't quite look like a 330, so that's probably a 160 or a 220, but it's got a spring on both sides. You can get body grips with a spring on just one side or a spring on both sides. And again, these are not designed to capture and hold. There's no releasing animals when they're caught in this style of trap. And that's these style are used way more often underwater uh, for muskrat, beaver, otter, critters like that. Um, we can't use large ones on, on dry land for obvious reasons. There's no releasing animals that do get caught in these. And then of course a snare, especially set underwater, that is a killer trap too. Those animals are gonna be dispatched by the time you get there. Now trap prep. This is one thing, this is why I always recommend uh, people buy used equipment. You know, we've got actually a big fur uh, FTA rendezvous, the 55th rendezvous coming up in Southern Wisconsin. There's gonna be probably dozens and dozens of tailgaters there selling used equipment by used. Not only do you get a little bit of a discount, but most of the time it's 99% ready to go. When you buy a brand new trap, you get it, it's shiny metal, uh, you're a long way away from being able to use that thing. The first thing you got to do is get all the grease off because it's coated with grease so it doesn't rust sitting on the shelf. You got to get all that off and then you've got to weather it for a while. Let it build up a little bit of surface rust just so it's got um, something for the dye to uh, stick to. And then you're going to dye it, either use a speed dip type uh, formula, which utilizes white gas or Coleman lantern fuel, um, something like that, and, and uh, dye to dip your traps in. Or you use something like the logwood trap dye and some boiling water, and you let them soak in there and, and get that dye and then uh, wax them. So waxing is something you never want to do to your killer traps. You do not want to make uh, any body grip traps hair trigger, but this is a great thing to do, especially if you're focusing on coyotes. It protects your equipment. It makes your trap super fast. It can also uh, do things like keep any smell that there might be in there. And 
Um, so yeah, really good thing to do. And it, for most people that just are trapping a little bit here and there, if you die and wax your traps, it, you can probably get two, three, even four seasons out of a lot of that. Now, if you're trapping every day, nuisance trapping or something like that, you're definitely doing it every year. But for most people, they can push that a little bit. Now, traps aren't the only equipment you need. That's obviously a big part of trapping, but you need some other stuff too. And you can see in these pictures uh, for dry land trapping, you have to have a sifter to sift your dirt, uh, pan covers to put over your pans. These are nice. You don't have to use these. You can also put a little bit of uh, toilet paper or even leaves either on top of the pan like a pan cover or even wad it up and put it underneath the pan. And basically all these devices do is make sure that you maintain a, a hollow or an open air pocket underneath your pan. Because when we're setting traps and we're digging them down and burying them in the dirt, uh, obviously if it fills in under the pan, it's no longer a trap because if that pan can't move, it'll, it'll never fire. So that's what they do. You also need a bait and lure. And that's an important distinction to make too, make too. There's a big difference between bait and lure. Bait is anything that can be eaten. And so bait is not selective at all. You know, bait would be something like beaver meat. A lot of trappers save your beaver meat, eat a lot of it, but whatever you don't eat, you can uh, save. It's, it's excellent bait. All predators, it's a prime, uh, basically, meat for all predators. And it actually has some fat in it, which is, is pretty good because if you're out trapping and it's pretty cold, if you take a small chunk of venison, you'll notice it's frozen rock solid. You try to smell it, you can't smell anything. Chunk of beaver in the same conditions, because it's fatty, it's oily, it doesn't freeze. And you, you can smell it. Even with our really bad human nose, you can smell it. So yeah, beaver meat, excellent bait, really good for human consumption as well. Uh, other good, you have to have a staking system. Steaks, this is just as important, if not more important than your traps. If you aren't staked properly so that your trap stays there, no matter what animal you catch, then you're not trapping. You're out there basically giving trappers a bad name, which is not a place you want to be at. So a lot of people these days use what are called cable stakes or earth anchors. That's what's here in the picture. Uh, you have a driver to drive these things down and then a mallet, a hammer to, to hit that and strike them down. But it's a little piece of metal on the bottom of a cable. You drive that down yank on it with all your might, make sure it's set and that's your staking system. You could even double stake, you know, use two of those at different angles to make a little bit of a, a X pattern. Um, the vice versa of the cable stakes is gonna be the actual metal like re-rod style stakes. Those are good too. It's just, you have to carry a lot more weight because uh, obviously re-rod is gonna weigh more than a, than a cable stake, but same idea especially when utilizing a solid stake like that. Most people going for coyotes are going to utilize a double stake system and drive them in in, in an X pattern to make sure that you, uh, no critter out there can pull them out because a coyote's a strong animal. Uh, other good things to have in there, knee pads, just because you're constantly kneeling, especially on frozen ground, really tough on your knees. Uh, gloves that can help with the scent. I like to have separate gloves for handling traps and then separate gloves for handling your bait and lure so that you don't contaminate your traps with any any of that scent. And then things like files and multi-tools because you're constantly having to tweak uh, and mess with your equipment out there on the field, especially after, you know, it's been there, it's been frozen, it's been unfrozen. Um, a lot of times you're messing with the dog or doing some filing out there. so. Got to be prepared for that. Now, I alluded to this earlier, the best management practices of trapping. This has been really just a great benefit of trappers. Now, I'll say when this first started, a lot of trappers were leery of it because they thought it was going to basically come down with a bunch more restrictions, which really has not happened. First off, the BMPs are a suggestion. They're not required. But basically what they've found out through the BMP process, which is a formalized research project to look at the humaneness of trapping, uh, basically what they found out is the systems that people are using 
are largely they they pass the BMPs with flying colors. So these are all public information. You can go uh, if you go on Google and search AFWA. So that's not AFLAC like the uh, the insurance duck guy. Um, it's AFWA, which is the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. They've uh, led the charge on this. They've got them all posted on their website. You search AFWA fur bears on Google and it'll come up. Not only all the BMPs, which you can search species by species to find trap recommendations, but you can find a lot of other cool research and stuff about trapping on there. A uh, really good resource, good way to, to, when you're looking at buying traps, to get a good idea of what's good to use. Because the, the traps that score well on the BMPs just so happen to be, uh, most of the time, the best traps at capturing and holding the animals, which is why naturally a lot of times trappers are are defaulting to using these devices anyway. Um, nine, it started in 1997, so it's been going on a long time, and it actually amounts to one of the largest research projects ever conducted on wildlife for the duration and for the amount of states and people who have been involved. Really cool. And the process, it's not, uh, I mean, it's ironclad. They actually have ISO, ISO standards, the international standards, uh, the, the same type of standards that are applied to agriculture are applied to testing these trap systems and really cool how they do it. They use actual trappers, they find volunteers and they send a technician out with them. Uh, the trapper selects the spot, the technician uses a random number generator to determine what, uh, what trap type they're going to set at that location. And then uh, they come back when they run the trap and any animal captured is immediately uh, dispatched and then bagged and frozen to undergo a full necropsy by some of the best wildlife vets in the whole nation, all the way down to radiographs. And they look at every bone, every nail, every tooth, and they score any damage that, that could be from trapping. So really cool and a really a benefit to trappers because quite honestly, when animal rights activist groups, they really don't do this anymore because they know the data is ironclad. But when they used to attract, attack trapping on the basis that it was inhumane, um, when basically all of this BMP data got into the court of law, I mean, trappers just bowled them over. They won because it's, it's, uh, it's good data and it's a giant mountain of data set. So big benefit to trappers. And for the most part, they started out leery of it, but they've uh, for, you know, come around now to where most of them are proud of it, uh, proud to support it and proud to uh, pass along all the go good stuff for the BMPs. Now, let's get a little bit into methods here. I mentioned before there's land sets and water sets. Well, these are really easy to identify because basically if it touches water, it's a water set. If it doesn't, it's a land set. Um, so this, you do have to run both types of sets every day, so there's no difference there, but there are different traps that you can set in the water and different traps you can set in the land, so you do gotta, gotta know that. Move right, oh, I'll just that picture right there, uh, it does have, you'll see a little aluminum foil wrapped around the pan. This is a cool little uh, technique. It's, it's, uh, I use it, but I didn't invent it. It definitely, a lot of people do this anywhere where you have open water, uh, like a riffle when a lot of the water is frozen, it seems to work excellent because animals like raccoons are really drawn to that one source of open water to look for food. And you can actually just take your trap, whatever that's a number 11 double long spring, which is an excellent raccoon trap. Um, really small, but it's strong. If a coyote doesn't bop out, uh, bend the base plate, they'll even hold a coyote uh, because they're, they got two springs that are close together in a small trap. But if you wrap the pan in the aluminum foil and put it in the moving water, in the moonlight, it looks like a fish or a clam or something that's yummy. And a lot of times you'll catch them by both front paws. They'll go for that. So kind of a cool way to trap. And of course, one that doesn't have basically any appeal to domestics. So if you're trapping an area and you are worried about dogs, I'd be a lot less worried if I'm putting traps in the water that just have aluminum foil on the pan as opposed to something with, you know, fish in a hole or, or some type of bait. 
All right, so let's get into some basic beaver sets. Uh, beaver dam, one really, really great way, easy way, because the dams are so obvious, there's always a trail that goes over somewhere right in the middle of that dam, uh, an overwater trail. And this is used by beaver, muskrat, uh, and otter. They'll all use it. So it's a great way to catch any of those critters. Um, but yeah, that's uh, it's obvious because obviously the dam sticks out. You don't have to find tracks. You don't have to find anything. Find the dam, find that little trail. You're good to go. Now, for other beaver sets, let's say you don't have the dam as an option. Some other really popular sets are baited sets or caster mound sets. And so these snares over here on the pole are going to recommend a baited set. If you just find a pole of some softwood, aspen, popple, um, willow, anything that you see the beaver actually eating on, you just get a long pole of that, attach your snares to it just like that, or you could do the same thing with body grippers and then scrape a little bit right where they are, which shows that green, that inner green bark, the cambium, which looks like a T-bone steak to a beaver. Excellent way, you can put them in open water, you can put them under the ice, even if you don't know where the beaver are coming from, where they're going, uh, if you can intercept them, that's a great way to, to do it. And then especially in the spring, which we're getting to, um, beaver trapping goes to the end of March, beaver and otter, in the springtime, it's starting to get just like the deer rut. It's starting to be like the beaver rut. And uh, the one and a half year olds are getting pushed out. They're moving around and uh, they're looking for other animals. And the, the scent that they use to mark their territory is this caster scent. And so you can uh, kind of emulate what they do make a little mound, just throw some mud up on the bank above the water's edge, make a little rough mud pie basically, and then put some caster. You can buy that commercially or save it from the beaver you catch uh, there on that mound. Excellent way to catch beaver, especially in the spring. Um, and really also a good way for landowners. Let's say you have a place where you want beaver, but then you also have places you don't want beaver. Uh, leave the beaver alone on the beaver pond in the back 40 that you want to keep and just trap in the spring coming in and out of there and you're basically going to get just the the travelers those one and a half to two and a half year olds that get kicked out and not impact your little local population there. All right and then uh, these muskrat and beaver both so these different set types you can see uh, the body grip in the top right, which is a 110, has a little bit of a, a carrot on the uh, trigger. That's a popular bait for muskrats. Muskrats are herbivores. So whereas for beaver, people will sometimes use bait like carrots or something like that, or even little twigs on the, on the trigger. I would say it's probably more popular for muskrats. Um, I've even heard of people that just skip the bait and will put something rubber or um, something that's not food but is white or green and looks like a root or a tuber that they naturally eat and and they apparently are effective too but um, the thing about those baited sets you can put them out anywhere even if you don't know where they're coming from or, or going to so a great way to do it you can do them uh, even if you look at the top left picture that one's set up with a foothold so now I'm not a body grip, but since it's set underwater and it's set in a way that basically the trap can't reach the surface, that's a, a submersion set, a drowner set. So that would be a killer type set, even though the trap itself is not a killer trap. Uh, obviously under the water, it is gonna function like that. And then um, the way when you do put those body grip traps on sticks like that the nice thing is if you're in an area where there's beaver there's going to be a bunch of sticks floating around everywhere usually they're straight they're about the right length uh, to just go ahead and slide through the springs of your trap and you can use smaller sticks to wedge in there to sort of uh, firm them up so they're not loose but that's one nice thing beavers provide uh, sticks to actually stake their own traps which is really nice of them 
Now, the, probably the most popular way that people trap muskrats, and it's a little bit hard to see in this picture, but you can see a really well-defined trail that runs right along uh, the rock there. And so muskrats are basically like the mice in our house. When you go to trap, trap a mouse in your house, if you have one, where do you put the trap? Everybody puts it along the wall because mice always run along the wall. You're not putting that thing in the middle of the floor. You're putting it along the wall in a dark corner. And uh, muskrats are the same way. They have certain areas that they frequent travel and they'll develop a run, a trail that uh, most of the time is visible. And so really, if you see that trail, all you have to do is put a trap in that trail, no bait or anything, and just wait. It's a blind set, but that's the way a lot of muskrats are trapped. Now here in Illinois, we can't use colony traps, no multiple catch traps. Uh, so just using 110 body grips, or you could use uh, footholds, but um, definitely just putting unbaited traps right in the trail is probably the way that I would guess somewhere around 75% of the muskrats are caught out there. But if you do like to build things, the little float up in the upper right, uh, this is another great way to catch muskrats and you don't have to find the trail. So in a lot of big ponds where people may be dealing with nuisance, mus nuisance muskrats, uh, a float like this can be an excellent way to bring the muskrat to you rather than the other way around. And again, apple slices, carrots, make good bait, parsnips, cattail roots. If you just got cattails around, you can dig up the roots and uh, skin them up so they look real nice and bright white. And again, it's like a T-bone steak to the little muskrats. Now, basic raccoon. Again, we talked about all the possibility, a lot of access, high numbers of raccoons. Like there's a lot, a lot of opportunity out there. And especially with the dog proof style traps, uh, the foot um, encapsulating or the enclosed trigger traps we talked about earlier. Awesome. Open up a lot of new spaces for you. And in this set here, this is one common set where people will just take a piece of white PVC, shove it right into the mud bank, and then they'll put a little bait, maybe some fish or fish oil in there, or maybe they'll use uh, some type of lure, especially getting later into the season and put your trap in the water right out in front of it. Pretty simple. Uh, another set type, we've got a leaning pole, a cubby on a leaning pole. So that actually has a body grip trap in it. So that would be a killer style uh, system, not a live restraining system, uh, but you'd put some bait in the back of that cubby. And then of course, the idea here is that being a leaning pole, it's pretty much selective for only raccoons. Uh, dog, is not likely to climb up that pole, nor is about any other thing that you wouldn't want to catch. So great way to uh, make the trap more selective just by utilizing what you know about the, the critters and what they do out there. Now a pocket set, if you're not using a PVC pipe to shove into the bank, this is the tried and true method for uh, mink and for raccoons at least and a lot pretty much every critter known to man has been caught with this set here but basically what you're doing is you're just digging a little pocket a little hole just above or at the water's level where you can dig it up up and out of the water and put a little bit of bait in there and that can be fish it can be carp that you save up from the year um, it can be muskrat if you've caught muskrat and you're not going to eat all of it uh, save pieces of that. Muskrat is a great bait for raccoon, otter, mink, um, and even for uh, the upland predators too, like coyotes and foxes and stuff. But um, And in the pocket set, almost always your trap is actually going to be underwater. That way you don't have to sift dirt over it like we would on a coyote or fox set. We just shove it into the mud, under the water, and the animals really don't seem to see it even when it's plainly obvious as long as it's under the water line. Uh, mink, raccoon, no issue at all. And then if you're able to stake that um, or s utilize a submersion or what they call a drowner rod or cable, you can turn any foothold trap into a killer trap system by, by utilizing a submersion system. So that would be some one-way lock that basically allows that trap to only go to deeper and deeper water, but not to shallower water. So 
one way to do it. Now, coyote sets. This is another animal, ton of opportunities out there, and I think the hardest animal to trap throughout the Midwest, that includes in Wisconsin where they have uh, fisher and wolf, and they occasionally have a wolf season. I haven't trapped a wolf myself, but the people I've talked to that, that have trapped a lot, the, they, coyotes are tougher, and it makes sense if you look at them. They're, like I mentioned before, one of the most persecuted animals across the landscape is the coyote. The hunting season doesn't end. The trapping season, you know, there's not a limit to the number you can get. Uh, also, nuisance um, issues, you know, uh, coyotes are a nuisance animal that landowners can deal with as they see fit. So basically, they're they're highly persecuted, and yet it's one of the, um, we already mentioned that there's probably more coyotes on the landscape in Illinois today than there has been at any point throughout history. So they're really good at evading people. And when, when you successfully trap or successfully hunt a coyote, in, in my opinion, you've done something that's more difficult than getting a big buck or doing about any other thing in, in the outdoors that you can imagine. So tough competitor, worthy adversary, um, dirt hole. That's what these pictures depict. This is probably how the majority of coyotes are caught across most of the Midwest and across most of the country to a lot of different variations you can do and a lot of different sets. You can also turn these into a scent post set or a flat set, walk through set. Uh, but the main premise is always going to be the same that whatever you're expecting the animal to go to, in this case, it's a small hole that's basically meant to design a fox cache. Uh, so this would be a place where a fox has cached some mice or something to come back and eat at a different time. Um, that's your attractor. You want to place your trap a coyote length away from that and uh, a little bit offset for me. And this is every trapper's got a different place that they put it. I go about 12 inches back from the hole and then about two inches offset. I go for a left foot catch. Uh, I always offset my trap to the left. It's just my preference. And guess what? 90, probably over 90% of the animals that I ever catch are always by the front left foot because that's what I set for. Um, yeah, we can look. Here's kind of some drawings that kind of show you what's going on under the ground um, using the same idea, whether it's a dirt hole or it's called a flat set. If you basically have it set up like it is where that, uh, the picture on the top left, where you don't have a hole, it's just a flat set. If you have a old piece of wood or something stuck up there where the backing is that you spray urine on, it could be a scent post set. Um, if you place stuff on both sides, it could be a walkthrough set. Um, if you dig a little trench that the animal has to step down in to get at the dirt hole, it's a trench set. So. There's a bunch of different variations on these. The main thing to remember when it comes to coyotes, you're always putting a foothold trap underground, uh, covering it with that sifter with a light layer of dirt so that basically when you leave, it just looks like a small hole and like you weren't there. If it looks like anything else, chances are you're not going to catch a coyote. Now, it's still possible to catch a fox or a bobcat. They're a little bit easier. Both of those species are, in my opinion, and in most people's opinions, than coyotes. But you do have to do things pretty much perfect to catch coyotes, at least with any regularity. Again, anchoring system, vitally important. Another tip here, use more than one scent. And I learned this from Mark June, one of the best coyote trappers alive right now, in my opinion. Um, he likes to use three cents at every set location. He thinks it gives him like just one more second or two of the coyote hanging around because he actually puts a lot of cameras on his sets and he studies the animal's behavior. And he'll tell you when a fox or a bobcat comes to a set, it may be there for a long, long time. It's going to give you lots of opportunities to catch it. But 99% of the time, coyotes come up two to three seconds later, they're gone. You never see them again. 
So if you haven't done everything perfect, you're not going to catch them. Uh, but one thing that he noticed is they do tend to stick around a little bit longer if he used more than one scent. And it's almost like they're cracking the code, right? They're smelling, oh, I smell a little bit of muskrat. Oh, there's a little bit of red fox here. And oh, there's a little bit of gland lure. So just if you have those multiple uh, scents that the animal almost has to decipher, it gives you maybe a little bit better odds. So good little tip there. Now with trapping, catching the animal is only the first part, okay? You got to lug all the traps out there, find where they are, crack the code of how to catch them. Then there's this whole other aspect, which is uh, really work heavy. And this can be something that uh, trapping's not for everybody, okay? If you are more on the sit back and ride style, uh, trapping's probably not for you because it's, it's intensive. And I know uh, people that, that are doing it big time. I mean, you're up before daylight and you're working until way after dark and you barely have enough time to sleep. It's just the way it is. Um, a big part of it is once you get that animal back, now you need to utilize that. Um, Cause we, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people need to realize when it comes to trapping trappers, a true trapper is utilizing their catch to the best of their ability. Now, does that mean that you're eating all the coyotes that you catch? No, it doesn't. But you are making the most use of what's there. And so some critters like coyotes are not known to be good to eat. Now, can you eat them? Well, certainly you can. They're not known to be good. There's also some issues with rodenticide. Anybody who puts out rodenticide, mice eat it. Then the coyotes eat the mice. That stuff can bioaccumulate and can actually be a danger for us to then bioaccumulate in us. So, uh, but fur is, is, that is a use, that is a legitimate use. And we'll talk more about it here in a slide or two, but uh, basically we as humans, we've got a couple major deficiencies. One of them, we don't have body hair all over the place. When we get too far away from the equator, we need some outside thing to help us warm, warm up. And a lot of you, especially in Northern Illinois right now, you know, pretty cold and windy out there. So if we were to go outside right now with just what we were born with, and you had the choice of a steak or a fur coat, I know which selection you're going you're gonna to pick. So uh, just the premise that for some reason food is a greater or more no noble use for animals than warmth, it just, it doesn't hold up when you really think about it. Now, the equipment that you need when it comes to fur handling, you see this wooden device here kind of in the center, that's called a fleshing beam. So once you actually skin and get the, the pelt off the critter, that would be what you drape it off to use that two-handed, uh, that's a necker fleshing knife in the lower right. You'd use that to push any remaining meat, flesh, uh, fat off of that hide. And then you'd put it on a stretcher, which said a bunch of looks like muskrats or possums on wood stretchers there. Um, you put them on there so that the pelt basically achieves its largest size and then it can dry without shrinking up and uh, just look in a presentable way for, for the fur market. So utilization, I, I talked about it uh, just in the last slide. Um, fur for the same reasons that it's basically ecologically responsible to hunt to get your meat you know it's a green way to get meat a hunter's diet is going to be more green than any vegetarian or any vegan out there um, the, for the same reasons wearing fur a lot of times is going to be a much more ecologically responsible source than any alternative so I don't care what your coat is, who makes it, if you go and look into the materials that go into making that coat, where they come from, where they're shipped to, and all that, uh, you're going to come up with a carbon footprint that makes just a few animals look like a really small price to pay to stay warm. So uh, basically the old Disney view, the Cruella de Vil of trying to turn a villain out of anybody wearing fur, it's it's basically just arguments that don't make sense that are rooted in, um, you know, misheld belief. So we got to try to get around that. A well-made fur garment, they say, can last for three generations. 
So if you go out trapping in your local spot and you catch, let's say you catch 10 raccoons and you get a coat like the one pictured here made, that's going to be the warmest coat you have in your whole house, I promise you. But it's also going to be an heirloom that you pass down to your kids and maybe they pass down to their grandkids. And then at some point, you've got a grandkid sitting around some somewhere saying that they're wearing a coat made out of raccoons that their grandfather or grandmother caught in this creek, you know, 60 years ago. I mean, what what article of clothing or what piece of hunting gear do you have that can be as cool as that? I, there isn't anything. So um, really a, a great time to personally utilize fur. There is still an international fur market. It is low. So you're definitely not expecting to make money. Uh, but the important part is that you utilize your catch. So if you're not going to personally utilize your fur to make something like a hat, gloves, jacket, or uh, anything for your house, then you do need to sell that, not for the money, but just so that that fur does get utilized and uh, that animal's put to the best use possible. Um, now, as far as how do you access the fur market, there's a couple different ways. One way is the Fur Harvester Auction, FHA. Um, you can search them on Google. You can ship fur to them and they're basically a fur brokerage company and um, they'll put your fur out, sell it on auction, and then they'll just send you a check back less their commission. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, you can either mail the fur in or they do have pickup locations. Then there's also private fur buyers. And so this might be a little bit more popular nowadays now that NAFA, the old large fur brokerage company went out of business here a couple of years ago. A lot of people are going to these local buyers here in Illinois. We're lucky we've got Grunewald Fur and Wool is a really great fur buyer, goes all around the country. Um, but yeah, he schedules stops all around Illinois. You just meet him at that stop and they actually pay you right then and there. Uh, fur buyer, well, it's Somebody who works for Grunewald Fur and Wool will grade your fur, come up with a fair price and offer that to you. If you accept, he'll take the fur, he or she will take the fur and then write you a check uh, right then and there. So you get money quicker than the fur auctions. It might be a little bit less because the, the fur buyer might be wanting to make money, whereas the fur auctions theoretically are selling to uh, people who are wanting to make things out of the garment. So there might be one more level of middlemen using the, the, the local fur buyer route, but it is cash in hand. So uh, nothing wrong with that. But again, personally utilize. Uh, once you get the animal past the skinned, the fleshed, and the dried part, it's stable. So you don't need to really refrigerate that. You can hold it in your garage, keep it out of the sun. You got a little bit of time to work with, but uh, luckily there's a tannery in Iowa called Sleepy Creek Tannery, and we'll have, there's a link to it here further on in the presentation. They're not that far away. They've got good prices and their turnaround time is not that bad. Um, some of the other like Moyles Mink and Tannery, another excellent tannery. It's just when you do send stuff to them, you might have an eight to 10 month wait before you get it back. Uh, the thing I like about Sleepy Creek Tannery in Iowa, I've been getting stuff back in like three to four months, and we use them quite a bit in Wisconsin, and we always get back a really quality product. They do good work, good prices. Check them out. Once you get it tanned, now it's open. Either you experiment with making stuff yourself, or there's some excellent uh, furriers out there that can make stuff for you, and I I just got to shout out a couple friends of mine in Wisconsin that are excellent furriers. They're both trapper education instructors. One is a guy by the name of Don Bierman. He has a business on the uh, Mississippi River side of Wisconsin called uh, Wild Things Fur. He sells equipment and stuff like that, but he'll also take your tanned pelts and sew up basically anything you need. Very good prices mountain man style hat which is the fur hat with the ear flaps and everything really nice uh his going rate last i checked was around 60 to 70 bucks for that hat using your furs so uh really inexpensive for an item that'll be the warmest thing you own and something that may wind up being a 
family heirloom too. So a lot of reasons to trap. Don't let the low fur market uh, keep you back. Um, and even if you if you get it tanned and you don't get anything made, there are a lot of people that just try to develop markets for then selling the, the tanned uh, critter. So another way for opening up new markets for them. Now I mentioned the resources. Here's a bunch of them. Check out the trapping BMPs. Uh, we here at the University of Illinois, we've got colleagues that put together um, human dimensions reports on Illinois trappers. So a lot of good information you can check out there. And really, we want to encourage people to join uh, the Illinois Trappers Association, the IPA. Um, we do have a, a Trappers Association right here in Illinois. Great group to join. Join up and you're going to get access to the Trappers Post, which is one of the best trapping publications out there. It's uh, uh, definitely won't be disappointed in that magazine. And then also we've got the Fur Takers of America, who's been a huge partner to our program, a big time friend of ours. We have to give them a shout out. Definitely join them up and you're going to get a different magazine, which is also a great trapping magazine. Uh, you get the Fur Takers magazine with them. You get 12 issues of it, which is awesome. And they've got the big rendezvous coming up. So you don't have to be a member of FTA to come to the rendezvous. Uh, but we definitely encourage you to do both. Join the ITA, join the FTA, and then come out to the rendezvous, uh, which is June 22nd through the 24th in Jefferson County, Wisconsin. So not that far away from Illinois. We, the Illinois Learn to Hunt team, we're going to be there. I think we're going to try to camp. There's bonfires every night. It's going to be a good time. Uh, Friday, actually, the 23rd, so this is of June, June 23rd at the FTA rendezvous. They're doing what they call the Trapper Man feed. I've been to a couple of these. These are epic. Um, so it's it's uh, Trapper Man is a website Paul Dobbins created for basically trappers can, to, to chat. And every year they sponsor this Trapper Man feed which is a big wild game feed. And when I'm talking wild game, you go there, there's gonna be alligator. There's probably gonna be iguana. There's gonna be beaver, deer, elk, squirrel, rabbit, rattle, you name it and it's probably there because they've got trappers coming from all over the country to put this together. And uh, that's Friday, that, that's just one thing that happens there. So I had to bring that up because it's a, it's a cool thing and I saw a post about it today. Trapper man feed on that Friday. Anyway, FTA rendezvous. I've gone on a lot about that, but we hope to see some of you there. And we've got some stuff coming up with that. I'm going to turn it over to Jason to, to tell you about some of this cool stuff. Sure. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Uh, fantastic job. Uh, so yeah, so we have, again, this is just our upcoming events. So we're getting really into turkey uh, hunting and, and prepping for turkey season. So we have some webinars coming up for that. So we have Turkey 101, March 14th. Turkey 102 is going to be March 16th. And then uh, we're going to have a turkey calling uh, demonstration webinar on the 21st. And then we will also have um, the wildlife tracking we're adding onto that. So that's going to be March 23rd. So that's going to be after all the turkey uh, webinars there. And then we'll also have uh, the Honey Illinois podcast. We have new episodes coming out every couple of weeks. We're trying to keep that to an every two week uh, episode release. So keep an eye out for that. But you can find those on YouTube as well as Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, and every other type of streaming uh, software you can possibly look at. We also have um, West Trapper and Turkey in-person workshops coming soon. So <clears throat> as we said, we're trying to develop this type of trapper um, curriculum for everybody here. So uh, utilizing clearly Curtis's uh, some expertise in this. So we're going to tr try to get this out, get some hands on um workshops going so that we can actually get out and uh learn how to use these traps properly without just uh hearing about them so with that and curtis on is definitely big and yeah i just want to add on a little bit about the tracking sure. this one anybody interested in in trapping should definitely try to attend that webinar it's going to be fun we're going to devote the whole time just going into tracking identifying tracks and all that kind of stuff and we're going to go beyond fur bears there. It's going to be basically all the tracks you can you might encounter in Illinois. So that's going to be something that appeals to everybody. That's going to be a fun one. 
going to be a new one we've never done before, but mm -hmm. all about tracking uh, March 23rd. So definitely, I mean, they're all going to be fun, but that one's going to be super fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with the program, or if this is the first time that you've uh, checked us out because you're in a track uh, trapping and uh, haven't really checked us out for all the other things, you can go to our web, our YouTube page has uh, over 33 webinars that we've done uh, really since COVID is when we started putting them out. So the past couple of years, we've been uh, definitely cranking these out and there's a ton of information on that you can go look at. And uh, someone asked if we have a link to all the additional information. I'm sure when we send out the email with the PowerPoint, we can include uh, that list in that email so that we guys can click through that and also a, a link for the rendezvous as well. And we also have a podcast out right now where we talk to a Fur Takers of America representative. And um, we had we talked to them about the rendezvous and Trappers College. And I know in that YouTube, uh, page on that, on that YouTube uh, video in the description, we have uh, the links for the rendezvous and the Trappers College, but we can include that in the email as well. For sure. Yeah, that's a good call out. Check out that podcast episode. It was the last. It, yeah, it's still the last one we released, I think. So it should be on yep. the top there. And uh, yeah, we talk in depth about the rendezvous. And if if you've never been to a trapping rendezvous, you're in for a treat. Like if you could picture basically a state fair from 150 years ago, that's what a trap and rendezvous is. And it's, it's amazing. I told you about the trapper man feed, which like that one thing alone makes the whole weekend worthwhile, but they have a ton of stuff going on. I mean, they, I, they have a big antler drive going on, a big photo contest going on, a bonfire scheduled for every night. They've got demos lined up uh, pretty much going on all day, every day. Some of the best trappers in the whole world uh, but just going to be giving their information out for free. Um, so a lot of fun stuff. We're, I'm already excited about it. We're going to be there. And yeah, like I say, we hope to see some of you there. We hope you're camping. Um, so we're going to have a good time. We're going to get around those bonfires. We're going to talk to some people that have been out there hunting and trapping for 50, 60 years. And there's no way to replicate that kind of information. That's, it's just, it's awesome. So I, I'm excited for it already. Can't wait. Curtis, what is the go-to recipe for beaver? Well, you can do anything that you do with any red meat with beaver. So any way you like to cook deer, cook beaver. The main thing with beaver is you have to remember about contamination of your knife. Caster is I, I forget the name there's some name for it but it basically has this quality where it fills a room so if you take a drop of caster and put it in your room immediately from all corners of that room you can smell it that also goes to taste because remember taste and smell are very connected so if you use the same knife to skin a beaver and then to butcher a beaver, you've, you've done a bad job. <laughs> so the first thing you gotta remember, skin it, use a different knife, the glands are gone, get the caster and the oil sack out of there. Now a different knife to debone the beaver is your first big thing. Um, and then, yeah, I treat it like I would beef or with deer. And actually back in college, you know, when I was a broke college student, we had a lot of parties where we made kebabs. And it would just be just a little chunk, a little square beaver on a kebab, little mushroom, little onion, green pepper, and be grilling them. And oh my gosh, people loved them. And not everybody knew it was beaver, but hey, it was red meat. It tasted good. We were broke college students. That's the meat we had on hand. And, uh, you know, we didn't get any complaints. So that's one way. I know a couple friends of mine in Wisconsin, they've actually started smoking beaver a lot. Uh, they'll put a whole beaver in the smoker and smoke that thing up. And man, they say it's great. It looks delicious too. You, I tell you, you want a conversation piece to put in the middle of your, of your plate on Thanksgiving or something like that. Uh, forget the turkey, bring out an entire smoked beaver and um, you're going to get some looks. Also of note, because we are in the season of, of Lent and all that kind of stuff, um, uh, how do I say this? Yeah, it's on Friday. You're only allowed to eat fish, right? No other meat. But there is a special qualification that you can eat beaver. 
because uh, for some reason they got that passed early on. They're like, yeah, you know, beaver, it's kind of like a fish, right? It's in the water. It's got scales on its tail. I'm like, yeah, it counts. So one little quick, uh, tip if you're Catholic and you're tired of only eating fish on Friday, supplement some beaver in there and you're, you're, still, you're still doing good. There you go. Awesome. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, you can put it in the Q&A right now. Um, if not, y'all can have a great evening. I, we actually finished right on time, Curtis. I'm very proud of you. Great job. Yeah, it's because I sped up my my talking muscle to 1.5. So I definitely <laughs> went through that a little bit fast, but <laughs> I knew that it needed to go a little quick to get through that. And yeah, again, we're going to have a lot of trapping videos coming out and we're going to have some in-person workshops where people can get out and do the hands-on stuff because there's no... Uh, no way to replicate replicate that here in this kind of setting, but hopefully we at least gave you a good overview of trapping, and hopefully some of you are excited to maybe give it a try. Absolutely. All right, well, we appreciate y'all, and uh, fantastic job again, Curtis. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you hopefully out at the workshop. Or in the field, either way. Sure. We'll see you out there. All right, we'll see y'all later. Have a good night.